Flams and drags are a staple part of our snare drumming vocabulary. They occur in virtually all traditions. They are, of course, very prominent in the North American rudimental tradition, the French rudimental tradition, although drags less so, which I'll come on to shortly. And they occur in the orchestral tradition as well. A cursory look at uh, De La Cluse's Etudes will see many examples and frequent examples of flams and drags. Today, I'm going to take a look at the technical aspects required to play flams and drags and a few applications as well. This is off the back of some lessons I've been having with my private students recently, uh, where flams and drags came to the fore and the exploration of technique was part of our lesson. And I thought I'd share my thoughts with you today. The main concept that I'm going to be discussing and which I think we all need to develop when it comes to developing our flams and our drags is in our control and our maintenance of different stick heights. A flam is a product of two stick heights which both travel downwards to the drum at the same time resulting in the lower of the two sticks striking first. The biggest problem people have here is starting well and then the low hand coming up to meet the high hand before both travel downwards together. If we start from this position, we can see that both hands are level. So it stands to reason, of course, if both hands travel downwards at the same time, both will strike the drum at the same time. If we raise one of them so it's higher than the other, if both travel downwards at the same time, it of course stands to reason that the lower of the two sticks will strike first. And there we have our perfect flam in terms of the technical execution. The problem is, as I have said, people start from this position, but then in the act of playing the flam, the low hand comes up and then they both travel down together. And the flam is lost. What we first of all want to focus on is gaining control over our wrists and fingers to create a sort of choreography of two different stick heights. Now it helps to remove the scales of degree such that we have one stick height that is high and one stick height that is low and we try to stick only to those particular heights. A flam generally, naturally, alternates. So if we start from this position, when we play the flam, generally speaking, we want to finish in this position with the opposite hand in the high position. Now as I'm performing that, you may notice it feels a little bit wooden because my wrists are doing all of the work. But this is an important preliminary step to teach us those differing stick heights. As we become more comfortable with this, that starts to loosen up a little bit and we lose that kind of robotic stiffness. But in the beginning, especially if you are unfamiliar with these movements, we want to start nice and slowly and controlled, really being rigorous with our adherence to the stick heights. So a flam, as we know, is one stroke hitting just before an accent, essentially. It doesn't generally make sense to have unaccented flams at all, I'll come to that shortly. I'll come to the application shortly. We, of course, can have unaccented flams, but the, the flam in itself presents a point of emphasis. But this is, this is to do with the application, which I'll come on to shortly. Nevertheless, a flam in general is one stroke striking just before the other. Now, a flam is a closed rudiment. That means it does not have any metric value of its own. It is tied to the loud stroke. So if we have a beat of four in a bar... If we add a flam to all four of those strokes, we have not added any metric value to the bar. There are still just four quarter notes in that bar. The flam kind of sticks like a mollusk to the side of the main accent. So we want the low stroke to be immediately before the high stroke. We don't want a slow flam. That pause generates metric value, meaning the low stroke has to have a note value of its own. Now, this is not a bad way to practice, incidentally. We can practice that uh, low stroke occurring quite a long time before the high stroke, just so we can smooth out the motions. But what we're aiming for is for that low stroke to be immediately before the high stroke. 
Now, I've talked about uh, the stick heights. What's happening in our hands here? What's happening in our wrists? Well, as always, we need to have a firm fulcrum and we need the fingers and the wrists to engage together to create the stroke. The wrist, in this instance, is essentially in charge of the stick heights. The fingers are involved in that last little engagement to create the stroke itself. Now, when I play a flam, if I don't think about it too much... <laughs> If I play it like that, there is actually very little finger engagement. There is a slight opening at the top and a slight closing at the bottom, but not much. As I've said, we're really focusing on the stick heights here. If we start to include that in a, in a larger figure, like a flammed paradiddle, then those fingers are engaging more. We'll come on to this shortly. But for now, we want to primarily be thinking about our fulcrum at the front and our wrist movements. Generally, to begin with, those fingers remain pretty closed, but a little bit of engagement to create the snap is desired, something that we can work towards. You can see as I bring that high hand up, the fingers open a little bit. Moving on to the drag which is a related rudiment. It is also closed. There are open drags, but they are not the topic of this video. Today I'm talking about closed drags. A closed drag is essentially like a flam, except that low stick plays twice. So it's a low double on one hand, followed by an accent on the opposite hand. <laughs> Now this one certainly requires the fingers to engage. This is perhaps where a lot of students encounter the most confusion because I've seen many of my own students try to bounce or almost buzz that low stroke in an effort to, to generate the two strokes of the drag. We have to slow this down and we have to be in control of both of those strokes and we have to cleanly articulate both of those low strokes. So in essence, this is a low double stroke. If we start from a low position with that stick height uh, very down close to the drum, we essentially have to adopt a, a drop catch. Now if I do that from the side, you will notice that the first stroke opens my fingers and the second stroke closes my fingers again. It's quite difficult to demonstrate on a video, but I, I hope you kind of get the gist of what I'm talking about here. Double strokes are something I've covered in previous videos, so I don't want to cover old ground here, but we are essentially conceptualizing the closed drag as a double stroke. These are not bounced as such. They are controlled double strokes that nevertheless uh, control the rebound. Now, as we get stronger at that, we can get lower and lower, more intricate, and those fingers are doing virtually all of the work. There is a slight tilting forward of the wrist to create the first piece of momentum, and then a snapping opening and close of the fingers to create the double stroke. But I can't stress enough that these are double strokes. This is not a bounce, this is not a buzz. These are not um, hit and hope double strokes where we kind of throw the stick at the drum and hope we get two clean strokes. These are engaged double strokes. We quite simply add the accent. <laughs> immediately after it. And as with the flam, this is an alternating rudiment. Now, one nice way we can practice this is to start with a big wide drag and slowly close it up as we become more comfortable. Notice I still have the stick height. One hand is always coming up, ready for the accent. The other hand is controlled and stays in a downwards position. Now it's worth, it's worth mentioning what's called a downstroke here, which is what the accented hand plays to begin from a high position, play the accent, and then finish in a low position. This is sometimes called a downstroke or a downward stroke for obvious reasons. It starts high and it finishes low. It moves downwards and it stays downwards. Now this again is a product of the fulcrum, the wrist, and the fingers all working in unison. 
We start from a vertical position. You can see the stick is held in my fulcrum and the fingers are lightly pulling the stick against the palm of my hand. The wrist plays the stroke or if we like, the fingers open and snap closed to play the stroke. Oops. And what will naturally happen is the stick will bounce. This would be a full stroke in this terminology. Now what we're going to do, as soon as we feel the impact and the rebound of that stick start to carry back upwards again, we're going to close the fingers. We're going to snap them closed and keep them closed and that is essentially going to stop the rebound dead. Now it's important here that we don't do this down on the drum. We don't want to play down into the drum and stop the rebound before it has had a chance to leave the drum head. We want that rebound to come up a centimeter or two, an inch, and then we want to trap it. I had the stroke, but I controlled it by snapping the fingers closed as soon as I felt the moment of impact. But not so soon as to actually press the stick down into the drum head. Now this is pertinent to both the flam and the drag. You can see in the case there of the accent, one hand starts high and then to alternate into the other side, we play that downward stroke and it finishes low. It's exactly the same process with the drag. We have the double on one hand and the down stroke on the other. I mentioned a moment ago some ideas regarding the application of these and I said we can't really have an unaccented drag uh, or an, uh, an unaccented flam and I want to clarify what I mean by this. A flam by default is a point of emphasis in a rhythm. Now of course we can choose to play the second stroke of a flam unaccented. <laughs> Now you see for the, from, the point, uh, from the point of execution, I still have to have one stick higher than the other to actually produce the flam itself. But from a point of execution, even if I am able to play uh, as close to unaccented flams as I can, within a figure, those flams are going to naturally act as points of emphasis anyway. We can hear the clave rhythm there through the flams, even though I am trying not to accent them. The points of emphasis we are hearing are not from a difference in stick heights, not from one stick being louder than the other, although it will be fractionally so, so I can actually execute the drag. We are hearing the natural emphasis of the drag, of the flams themselves, sorry. We are hearing the natural emphasis of the flam. That creates an emphasis within the rhythm whether or not we accent the high stroke itself. So from a point of application, a flam is in essence an expanded accent, even if, as I say, we don't play a physical accent on the high hand. So any figure that contains accents can be decorated by playing each accent as a flam. you can hear there just a widening of the accent which furthers the emphasis. As I just demonstrated, even if we were to remove the accented stroke from the high hand, we still get that same point of emphasis such that the rhythm is still discernible. Generally speaking, drags are used to introduce a phrase. So I hinted at a flammed paradiddle earlier. Let's take this as our example. A simple paradiddle has accents at the beginning of it. We can insert flams into those accents to create what is known a flammed paradiddle or sometimes a flammadiddle. It's simply the insertion of a flam onto every accent. Just at the end there, I played what's known as a flam tap, which is essentially a double stroke roll with a flam played on the first of each stroke. Again, it just serves to widen and it does bring in a point of emphasis on the first stroke of each double, which may or may not be desired depending on the context in which we're playing it. Flam, uh, drags, as I say, are a little bit less applicable in this regard. We can certainly begin a paradiddle with a drag. <laughs> But 
that you can hear we are limited in tempo so that we can actually fit the drag into the figure. A dragadiddle or a drag paradiddle as it's sometimes called quite often just plays the first accent as a diddle stroke instead. <laughs> But this again falls into the category of open drags, which is not the source, uh, not the topic of today's video. I'll discuss those uh, later. So drags typically serve to introduce a figure. As I say, they can they can really bring a figure into uh, stark contrast with the surrounding notes, or they can really serve to emphasise or crescendo a figure. We can hear there the drag gives a sense of occasion for every one of those accents, whereas a flam is a more ubiquitous, perhaps more typically applicable thing we can add into figures to just serve to widen any point of emphasis. The difference really is that flams can be played consecutively relatively fast. <laughs> This means we can put flams into figures where drags would be just a little bit more clumsy. So the, f the real fun, the real enjoyment, and this is where the rudimental drumming really shines, is in the collaboration of drags and flams. So we can take a simple well-known accent figure or rhythmic figure something like that. And we can use flams and drags in various ways to decorate this. Just a drag at the beginning of each figure and a flam on each accent can really serve to turn an original figure, which may be bare in some circumstances, into something that is actually quite decorated and enjoyable to listen to. So I hope this has given you a few things to think about. I wanted to keep it relatively short and sweet today. The main point I wanted to get across was the difference in the stick heights. The utilisation of the stick heights to produce these figures, to produce these accents, to produce the flams and the drags. Essentially, the quality of your flam is going to come down to how well you are able to control the stick heights. We want to get used to those sticks going downwards without coming up first. As we extend this to the drags, the quality of your drag is going to be completely contingent on your ability to accurately, and articu uh, to accurately articulate those two lower strokes. Now if you really want to pursue this further, the best way to do it beyond some isolated practice in terms of the motions is to tackle repertoire that contains flams and drags. John Pratt's work is amazing for this. Uh, the rudimental collection generally, the rudimental repertoire generally is absolutely full of flams and drags. Uh, John Pratt's especially is good in this regard. And of course, my own snare drum virtuoso has studies completely dedicated to what I've called Akiakatora strokes, these flams, drags, roughs and frises. So I hope this has given you a few things to think about and a few things to apply to your own practice and your own playing. I wish you the best of luck in your own uh, study, in your own practice, and I look forward to seeing you on the next video. Thanks very much.